Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, to this final session of today. It's our um, panel discussion, which will recap on some of the things that have come up during the day, and hopefully uh, this is where we hear some of the connections between speakers who have all been presenting individually. Um, firstly, uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers who have all given very amazing and uh, in-depth presentations today. I think there's a lot to reflect on, so I'm excited to, to hear uh, our panel discussion. Um, our panel tonight is co-chaired by Hito Stero and Karen Archie. Uh, and of course, uh, we have on the panel uh, Not Median Group Bitnik, which is um, Carmen uh, Weisskopf and Doma Smolio. Uh, we have uh, Judy Wiseman at the end here, who you heard talk earlier, of course, and also Olya Lialina. So I'm going to leave it to you guys. There will be an opportunity for questions. So if you have questions, please save them up and we'll take them as we go. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Stephen. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for coming back um, to this session. I'm delighted to be co-chairing this with Karen Archie tonight and tomorrow with Linda Stupart and the day after with Nina Power. Today, of course, a lot of things went through my mind when I was listening through all to all these presentations, which essentially spanned, you know, a period of at least 30, if not maybe, well, I, I guess around 30 years. And of course, all these transformations that have been mentioned today happen in a context which has been quite radical and which, when, when you were speaking, Olya, I was thinking about the Yugoslav war happening at the time of many of the works you presented. Later, of, or even before, there's the Iraq intervention presenting a lot of new, new the first Iraq war uh, presenting a lot of so-called new technology, the second, the third Iraq war. Then, of course, the massive economic transformations happening during the same time that were to affect the, the world of labor you were speaking about so cogently in an absolutely dramatic and radical way. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the, um, well, the Snowden leaks, but you know, the whole tradition of leaks and whistleblowers that have been going on at least for the past, I don't know, more than 10 years. So all of these events form like the backdrops of the technological, not only technological, but social um, major transformations we have witnessed within these years. And I think they cannot be separated from that. The absolute increase of inequality during that time, but also of, well, frankly, warfare and uh, violence. Um, well, <laughs> having mentioned that, <laughs> no, no, but it will be, of course, quite interesting to try to um, discuss your presentations, which came from wildly different angles in the light, or let's say, um, with keeping this backdrop in mind, because all of your basically contributions to the history of theory but also of art production during this period relate to that one way um, or another. And we were, Karen and I were thinking of trying to ask you very abstract questions which may not seem to have so much to do with your individual practices to create something maybe like a neutral ground, a common ground, a shared ground from which you are sort of equ equidistant, is that the word? Um, so I was very fascinated and I think I didn't really understand what you meant by the term latency, Judy, in your talk. You were mentioning it as a form of measure of technological acceleration. Uh, you were mentioning as an example that Google engineers gave you in trying to explain to you why they couldn't have more diverse work teams. So it would be great if you could um, start by elaborating on this notion in relation again to the question of time. What does latency mean? 
what does latency mean also in an expanded sense? And I think that I would also like to ask you the question of latency because it is so apparent, especially in your two last works, or I mean the two last works you presented, uh, in relation to, let's say, information space. There is a latent space, meaning a space which could be identified with the dark net or the black box of the postal system, the space that is not immediately visible, the space of infrastructure, so to speak, versus a more manifest corporate web which is much more, which has much more surface, let's put it like that. So maybe you could talk about latency in terms of things that are submerged on the one hand and glaringly obvious on the other and the relation um, of, of one to the other. And in your work, I was really struck, Olya, by this really moving example of what, what could be almost called like the aborted future, you know, of the web pages that never came to be. The web pages where people announce it will be there in two weeks if my mom allows me to work on the computer and so on. I mean, I haven't seen all the example you have, but it's a, a way of heartbreaking um, case study of latency in the sense of a potential that was present at a certain stage but never came to manifest. So the futures that didn't come to be. So maybe you could speak to latency in that respect. And also in the respect, and that would be basically the same question turned around. If you think about the corporate web today, is there already something latent in the early web of the 90s that like a seed, you know, that, that was already embedded in all of the um, examples of early technology you were describing that somehow managed to elbow, you know, uh, ev everything, every other possibility out of the way. Maybe, Judy, you could um, dis describe... Yes, I speak loudly. Do I, do I need the mic? I see yeah, maybe it's loud. being recorded, Judy, oh. I think. <laughs> Everyone says I always speak very loudly because I'm Australian. Um, so I can usually be heard. I mean, the reason I was, um, you know, being ironic about latency is that when I went back, I mean, latency is about the speed at which data moves. And I have several colleagues who work with me on the sociology of technology who work on high-speed trading on the city. Yeah. And so, of course, they all laughed, my guys, and said, but Jude, latency, you know, it's the key to everything. Because, of course, the financial trading is very much um, presupposes, it's absolutely built on the speed at which the data can go. And you know there's been huge um, problems, as you do, know, in the financial system in these last few years um, with trading. And what's kind of quite interesting about what they say now is that whereas, um, you know, they describe the transformation of when people actually stood on the trading floor trading shares and options and futures, to when it's moved to computers and people were looking at screens and you could see the data on the screens and so you were making bids on the screen. And now apparently the data literally is moving faster than a human eye can see it. So the latency's got to the point where it's moving and they're investing in more and more, I don't know, optical fibers or whatever. They're sort of making it move so that actually a human being can't physically see it on a screen anymore which is why the whole thing is now very dependent on automatic trading, that actually the algorithms are doing the trading with less and less human intervention. So it's sort of an interesting issue, I think, in terms of um, financial trading, but it sort of struck me, actually, as you were speaking, that it, it sort of has some, you know, it's interesting to think about in terms of art and visualising sort of art on the net, when actually the speed is now past human sort of, visual sort of cognition. So that, that's what I was thinking about as, as sort of you were speaking. And that's all I meant by it in, in, in terms of that. And, and, and sort of what that means then for sort of comprehension of what's going on on the web if it's past, what we can really see, you know, the visual, the screen. That was... Yeah, but... Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so loud. <laughs> Um, the, <clears throat> yeah, that's a very 
interesting question. I hope they would have more time to <laughs> think about it. Uh, the, um, about um, the speed and also the futures that never happened. And thank you for your remark about all this being heartbreaking experience because, uh, yeah, it's really that uh, dealing with the old, dead, and sometimes killed uh, web pages, it's a heartbreaking experience. So every page is a, uh, is, is a tragedy. Um, and uh, then also the ideas, because all the time, especially these pages that promise something, the idea about the future, and uh, sometimes you also see this, uh, this breathlessness. Uh, when you don't know what, on one hand, you, you know, you think that uh, in two weeks uh, I will get scanner and my page will be uh, the brightest and the most beautiful in the world. And on another, there is this uh, idea that maybe in one month there is no World Wide Web at all because uh, the, uh, since 97 we are told that the, the web is uh, to die <laughs> next month maybe, yeah? By, I mean now Wired magazine, but also this is what I remember from the own experience. You are working for the environment, uh, and uh, it's just uh, it can be making your own page, it can be a professional uh, designer. So, but you are working for something what is in the future, and at the same time you don't uh, you are prepared for immediate <laughs> death uh, the next month, and it was uh, always like this. And only now, uh, maybe we have a situation, I think I would say for the web history, unique situation that World Wide Web, the browser as a technology, established it perfectly. It's completely unkillable on technological level, but as a medium, it's, uh, it's really dying because it's getting more and more invisible. There was uh, some other part in your question. Yes, which parts were? latent in the early web culture, which became manifest in a corporate ah, yeah, yeah. way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think immediately, maybe there is some better answers to this, but I would, if to give immediate answer, I think that in all the contemporary or corporate web, we see the, still this wish to, um, uh, to, not to be like this, what was developed in 95, 96, because it was to be different uh, from uh, this very modern, loud, bright uh, culture of uh, 95. There is still in the professional web designers, in the ideas how web pages should be made, the <coughs> opposition, there is always the bad example. Yeah? And the bad example is what was the early web production, and so what we have is the idea to get away from it. What, but there is a maybe a, uh, example that is a bit different. I mentioned this under construction culture. They're very strong um, at that time. Idea uh, that uh, things are in the future, things are not done. Yeah? Every page um, will be updated. Even not the page that is, doesn't exist yet, but existing and but there is this under construction. It can be promise, can be excuse, but it should be there. And then professionals, the first wave of professionals came and they could not live with this. The first thing that was removed were under construction signs because if you want to sell the product, the website became a product, it should be done. So this vanished. And then with the web 2.0, with all the social services, we got this, again, this better version. Yeah, everything was better again. So this drive that, uh, yeah, things that are not done yet, they can be presented in the public. So this, I think, was the, like a heritage that was taken. It's completely another motivation, uh, another situation, it's um, a strategy, financial strategy, but it was interesting how in a new sense, but this under construction culture came and stayed, and even it's, it's very strong, it's stronger than before. How, how would you like to react to that? Um, I think for us, um, with all thinking about 
what you mentioned and trying to bring it together with our research in the dark nets. Um, I think the, the, the dark nets as we saw them um, are submerged or hidden networks or not so easily visible networks where um, you need to be, you need to con consciously or more consciously become part of them to participate then um, in the surface web. So in the surface web, um, I find that people are, you know, they're sort of a bit on Facebook, but doing something else at the same time. Whereas in the dark nets, it's a lot more like the 90s, I guess, where you, I mean, to put a web page, an onion page up in Tor land, you really need to have something to say or you want to be there. Um, communication is peer-to-peer. -peer. You want to communicate with that certain person. So it's a lot more conscious while at the same time being hidden, which, um, I don't know, it, it has this... Um, I think the network is a lot more apparent there than or feelable still as a me being connected to this certain other person than um, when I go online. Yeah? Yeah, and it's interesting that uh, it has never been easier, although within the encrypted networks, it's, it's, uh, you are kind of, nobody knows where the service are, is which you provide, or the website is you are providing to, to the dark nets. It has never been easier to be visible. You can, uh, you can be visible by having your mobile only, which is connected to the network and being a node on it, and which is passing traffic through or uh, running a website on your mobile phone, which is visible there, and which also produces something um, um, a quality which is uh, very temporary, very, where things are being meant to stay for a certain time and then disappear again. So it's, it's really fluid. Um, I wanted to talk or bring this conversation back to art a little bit and um, have another abstract question for each of you. Um, I'm thinking a lot about how the internet is a site for um, protest and politics in a sense that um, it marries very well and also very strangely with art and art object. And if you look at the early days of net.art and netart, um, these were very politically motivated um, scenes, as um, we could see through Olia's work and, um, and her colleagues in net.art. And um, as we've seen a kind of waning of um, art and um, technology um, being um, shown in exhibition contexts that um, aren't some sort of object-based object structure, I'm wondering more about the kind of relationship between um, the market and um, the political potentiality of um, art in, in the internet and um, how that has, um, how Olia specifically maybe could see that as um, a trend in her practice or... Okay, let, let me just extend the question to the other. Uh, participants. So art is uh, interesting because it's a specific example of labor that in my view, I mean you, you were talking about how people um, uh, express their wealth in, by, by being busy all the time, but I think the temporality of working in art is quite specific as it's mostly freelanced work, you know, and work that is scheduled either not scheduled at all or scheduled in quite tight units. So is there anything specific about the temporality of artistic labor? Um, that, or where, where does art sit in this triangle of um, time, technology, and occupation that you've been describing? Is there anything specific to it? And in relation to your practice, I wanted to ask you, because this has also come up in the debate earlier on, 
there is a certain um, fascinating connection between or, or, or um, a perspective on art as a sort of exterritorial space, meaning a space that is exempt from the law. We were talking about it before in relation to you know, uh, how to escape the law, basically, when you use art as a sort of almost extra legal space. We were talking about it, of course, in Peter's presentation when he mentioned the Zealand prank, right? So is, is art, how is it connected to an extraterritorial space? And you know, I mean, just to give one tiny other de 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 or anecdote, um, exterritorial spaces in, in the sense of being um, territories which are outside of taxation uh, feature very heavily in contemporary art right now in, um, in, 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 um, as free ports or free port storages. So you have a lot of work that is technically not in any sort of nation state or not under the jurisdiction of any nation state. So the question of art and territory would be interesting, but maybe Olya, you could um, start. Um, yeah, I was just, uh, then Karen, you were asking me, I was immediately, I was actually I was thinking to redirect this question to you because <laughs> you have a, a great and I think an absolutely brilliant uh, way of uh, bringing uh, net networks and network ac actionism, I would say, in a, a space that is uh, like clearly with the white walls. You know? <laughs> and uh, this is something uh, I think it's uh, not just <coughs> in interesting, but uh, the way you make it, it makes it much more than uh, all this, you know, attempts how to marry. As, as you mentioned, art and technology, <laughs> because it's not this. Yeah? And uh, unfortunately, we are very often in the situation that it's exactly yeah, um, uh, the, the intention just to see it as a computer art and how to, how to have something what is online translated into something what would be visible offline. And then it, is, uh, it can be beautiful, can be... Uh, not beautiful, but uh, I think the intention itself is a sort of uh, miserable. Uh, I was writing about this since uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2007, uh, the, this, um, when uh, we started to see in the galleries a lot of uh, work, um, of uh, a lot of online works. <laughs> Another question. <laughs> Yeah, and then it was uh, was immediately making a the, n distinction about uh, that it's completely that it's fine that things that were born uh, online uh, that work with uh, artists who work with web aesthetics, uh, whatever that th these things become object sculptures that they exhibited or just exhibited on the flat screens on the walls. It's uh, there is no there is no big deal. It, it's not a crime, and it's. If it fits, if it looks great, if it delivers a message, all this is great. But uh, I, what I thought is not hmm, what uh, what shouldn't happen is so, uh, uh, to say that web art, web aesthetics, it can be part of uh, uh, contemporary art, can be can be swollen. But uh, uh, net art as an idea, it it shouldn't be, become a part of uh, contemporary art scene. I guess what I was kind of trying, clumsily trying to get at is that when, like for a while we were thinking about net art as a kind of immaterial alternative to an object-based practice that exists in a market. And we soon realized that, of course this isn't immaterial, internet art is actually very based on a physical network and the politics of those network make it very complicated. Um, down to the minerals that were mined to be in your computer. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I think this also goes towards what Hito was saying about where physical objects are actually located and territorialized is very much um, its, its most problematic asset. Um, 
But yeah, I guess I kind of wanted to think about like what that kind of dichotomy between the realm of ideas being a kind of safe space for art and then the material realm being a problematic one or charged one or territorialized one. Um, and also I find it really interesting that in your work, it wasn't until you know, you could buy the drugs, you could like have the idea of the drugs, and that wasn't the problem. It was really if the possibility of a body ingesting one was the problem. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, um, I think that's one of the problems with immateriality, or also with, I mean, we, I think, we have a strong relation to um, immaterial art in the sense that I would say that um, m most of our works are actually conceptual art. But we realized early on that with technology you have to do stuff to make stuff happen, which is exactly what you describe with, with the drugs. You know, it was also, I mean, to have like the concept of a random online shopping bot that could potentially buy all this stuff, um, that doesn't make, um, it doesn't materialize enough to raise the interesting questions. And that's what we also like about losing control, that a lot of times we create situations where we have, I mean, we have some kind of understanding of what may happen, but what actually happens is a lot of times different to what we expected and it raises other questions, which I think has, if I were to say what art does really well, it's do that, surprise you with sort of, um, I don't know, um, ha having a, a certain the potential for, for an openness or for open endings maybe, which, which yeah, I would say is what makes it interesting, that, it, that its territory is not clear, that it can sort of, um, I don't know, go places you wouldn't expect. Is that sort of? Yeah, I mean, in, in thinking about what you were saying earlier about art being an actual kind of, like Stephen had asked you whether or not you feel kind of confined by the art world, and I, I was very de delighted in by your answer, which is that absolutely not. And maybe I'm, you know, just a pessimistic negative person, but I mean, I've, I feel personally very confined by the art world and the kind of art that one sees and the kind of way in which art can get um, displayed and how we transform um, certain practices into objects for no really good reason other than that's the tradition. And um, I guess I wanted to push back on like that, like your thought that this is actually a good thing because um, I feel like it would diversify, um, or the, our world could be diversified so much more to allow for different kinds of practices if we weren't having to kind of like make these performative projects like your own actually that was really rooted in a, in a performance of having a bot buy you things into a gallery system. Um, so, yeah, I was wondering if you could respond to that. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess the art world, uh, you would probably have to define, you know, what exactly are we talking about. But, I mean, I, I don't know. We as artists, we probably um, would also say, um, well, you know, I'm also part of the art world, and whatever I say is part of that. I mean, of course it doesn't totally work that way, but Delivery for Mr. Assange is a work we could never have produced within an, an art institution framework, never. You can do that as an artist alone online with the tools you have online, and that's the great thing about having that online space is that it gives you the tools to exhibit uh, such a live performance, but I'm not sure we would have found, I mean, funding partners, I mean, you know, anyone go, look, I have this idea, I'm going to send, you know, it's not something, I don't know. 
So, I mean, we work both ways. We, we try to um, not... Um, we try to also realize the ideas that we that do not um, find a, an immediate go within the art world, whoever the art world is. I, I really liked um, Peter's response today. Well, he, he didn't respond to anything. He was just mentioning that he thought being in prison, he would feel more free than surfing on the internet. <laughs> and maybe we can extend that to the art world. You know, <laughs> even being in a gallery feels sometimes better than surfing online. <laughs> Okay, but, you know, to, to come back to Judy. That's all right. I mean, yeah. I'm thinking about completely different things. Okay, Is that well, right? like, yeah. Can I talk about huh? Yeah, please. Yes? yes sure. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I must say for me, and, you know, I'm a very conventional sociologist, I mean, the questions about the net are really to what extent it's democratising or not. The sort of issues we discuss is, you know, that it's supposed to be democratising, but it's not clear to what extent it extends networks. And as you've been speaking, I've been thinking about whether web art, who sees web art, what the audience is, if it is a sort of different audience. And I, I'm particularly thinking about this because a, a friend of mine who um, works on social movements and the internet was at a conference just a few weeks ago. She was visiting from the States and she said that everybody there was discussing the fact that somehow the whole of sort of North London really was shocked that the Tories got in, you know. That, that what sort of that, that was it the case that they were that sort of progressive labor people were sort of inhabiting some kind of social media bubble where you could just be thinking that really there was a good chance that Ed was going to get in and then somehow there's this great shock and you know is, is there something about the social media that's fed into that 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 was the sort of discussion that was going on, given that if you read traditional media, i.e. the traditional newspapers, you would only have to pick up any of the tabloids to see that the right wing were doing very well, that the racists were doing very well. You know, so I think what, you know, what's interesting for me is the relationship between old media and new media and what that means in terms of its class base and, you know, and whether it's extending participation or, or whether it's not, you know, and that's, and that's partly a sort of trying to bring it back to the art, but it's partly a sort of question one can think about, can't one, in terms of net art and web art. Anyway, just, that's what I was thinking about. How, how would you connect that? So how, how does it connect to net art and web art? Well, I just mean who the, who the audience is, that's all. If you're doing that sort of politics, like I was very struck by the... Uh, um, Assange thing that you did, and I thought that was fabulous politics. I mean, I, you know, I could understand that politics very clearly, but I sort of thought to myself, I wonder who's watching that, who's that for, how you think about the audience for that sort of work, well, as opposed to having it in a, a conventional yeah. art space or... Yeah, I think the stumble upon possibility for internet art is much greater, obviously, than it is for let's say, a, a sculpture in a museum, because obviously you have to intentionally go to a, a museum to see it. Um, but for example, with Jody's you know, famous uh, bomb piece, like you have to know to look at the source code to be able to fully understand the context and extent of the piece. And this is something that I'm kind of interested in, and is, is how much education do we have to have to be able to kind of actually enter into these works to be like what how much of an indoctrination into an actual um society i guess as it were does it take and i think that's something that we all kind of want we all kind of want to lower that indoctr indoctrination level and then i think that the web is an interesting place to do that But then again, I mean, to come back to the example of the robot bot shopper, random bot robot whatever shopper, that thing, I thought it was almost, you know, like a perfect example for something you mentioned, meaning that um, even automated systems can fail so productively, right, that, that something else opens up, that technology is never... Um, determined, predetermined, and its outcome is sort of unknown. So introducing the random element into that, um, 
I, I found that like a very good example of what you were talking about, right? Okay, maybe let's ask in this moment of embarrassment of having <laughs> run out of further questions before I try to decipher my notes. Yes, there is a question. Thank you. Uh, could you raise your hand? Who's got a question? Um, sorry, just um, uh, picking up on point from a few minutes ago. Is it important to think of um, the piece, uh, what's it called exactly, um, uh, the delivery for Mr. Assange, is it, is it important to think of that as art and what kind of, what comes with the politics of thinking it, of it as art as opposed to just, you know, it, it as an action, a political action? Um, like what, what's added to thinking of it as art? Um, I, well, I think during the live performance, um, it was picked up by art blogs, but also by news, um, you know, uh, blogs or newspapers, online journals. Um, and I, I do, I would say that um, it has a news worth, and uh, no, it has a worth that is higher than just the news worth. So in the two days of the performance, um, you had a lot of people writing about the performance, but I think um, what the art world, or what we can do as artists by bringing the work back into the art space and trying to give it um, um, a stable form in, in whatever format, you know, as a, we tend to use video installation, but it would, you know, could be anything, um, is that you have a longer time for reflection on a lot more questions. Um, there's a lot more references that, which open up, you know, um, to male art, for example, to uh, fluxes, to whatever other practices you want to see, to other topics. And, I mean, um, we were asked a lot about the political message of delivery for Mr. Assange, which um, we sometimes thought was really absurd because, um, <laughs> I mean, if you, as, like, as a political activist, if you have a message you want to bring across, there's probably, like, more efficient ways to do that. And I think that, that that's what, um, the, the whole poetics around it, they sort of, they're a bit lost in, in the two-day performance, but they can sort of, you can sort of try to get them to resonate more within an art space. But it's yeah. interesting. And there was like a, a second part within the project where we started to work together with Julian Assange by sending more parcels to other people. So there was one parcel going to Nabil Rajab, which is a Bahrainian activist, which was mentioned here. And there, like in our collaboration with WikiLeaks, we really had to we saw that there are like clear differences in, in meaning of that. We always think that, you know, whatever happens to the parcel is part of the story and it can fail. You know, it can break and it can go. This, and, and, and this is it. I mean, like, uh, it's gone. And this is something that they wanted to, they want to, to, to control that situation. You know, they wanted to control the message they're trying to do and we we're really, uh, at the beginning, we really had to work together so that we have a common understanding that things can break, things can fail, and that we, as, as uh, within arts, we are we should be able to do to to to, to experiment and and also have the right to fail. Yeah, I mean, I always keep coming back to the question of time because, again, you know, the excruciating slowness of that delivery was really fascinating in your work, and I think this was a major component of what it was about, that it was just so slow, which reminds me again of your slowing down of the, of the service speed, you know, in order to be access, to be able to access the work even properly. And what you were mentioning again, uh, high frequency trading, I mean, there were attempts to create more 
let's say, fair trading places, which would take away the advantages for people who have better or faster cables by putting kilometers of wire around certain exchanges just in order to create a sort of equal access in time, which made me think that maybe we were talking about you know, access and the myth of access, especially in early web culture in the 90s, but maybe access is not only a question of material access, you know, of being able to plug into the network or access in space, but access, we have to think about it in terms of time, you know? creating somehow an equal speed for people to access things somehow equally in the speed that, I mean, it's very paradoxical that I should be saying that, but uh, a speed which is still adapted to the human eye, you know? which is not faster, which uh, doesn't exceed the latency period, so to speak. It's, uh, I hope it's related to what you say, <laughs> because I think, uh, uh, yeah, we all know that things are very fast, but also how fast things become history. I was invited some time ago to the great conference, Rofl, um, uh, uh, Rolling of Laughing at MIT, uh, to talk about the history of animated GIFs, and it was the conference, and it's uh, the conference about uh, MEMS. And uh, it's made by brilliant people, and it was uh, also the audience were, uh, was great, but uh, young. <laughs> it's not bad, so great young people. And then they talked about Internet of yesterday, Internet of the past. Uh, they meant 2006. <laughs> so just uh, a little before YouTube, and I was thinking, it was for the first time that I re realized, it's just uh, almost an anecdote, yeah, I realized that there is uh, already a new past. <laughs> and I'm, uh, so, was going to talk about the previous past, but yeah, I was <laughs> Are there any other questions? Hi there. Um, I was wondering if each of you could describe what FOMO is, briefly. FOMO eyes? No, just what it is. <laughs> you mean for us personally or within our practice? Okay. I presume, you know, um, that FOMO is used to describe what is supposedly a, um, a, a digital, a, you know, a connectivity and awareness of um, ubiquitous 24-7 connectivity. Uh, I mean, I think, all, uh, I think a lot of the social theory I was talking about which talks about sort of timeless time, very much talks about the contemporary sense of time as one of instantaneity, you know, that everything is happening at the same time and all at once. Um, and so it's very hard to, to sort of carve up time, to think about time in different ways. It's sort of, sort of like a ubiquitous presentism that everything's going on and that that condition invokes an anxiety then about making choices about what you can possibly do and where you can be that will be choices that you can regret, that you will afterwards regret and think, which seems to be quite an old thing, which I remember when I was young thinking, or at a conference, I always think, I'm always at the wrong workshop, you know, afterwards somebody's been at a better workshop, but it's a, but I think it's very much described in terms of a condition that that digital technologies connectivity is bringing forth. That's my sort of um, sense of it. And actually, um, I mean, I, I, if I can just be a sociologist for a moment, I mean, I'm, I went back and read um, George Zimmel's description of the city in 1900, where he talks about the frenzy of the city, that when people move from the country to the city, that the speed of the city 
that the number of people in the street disoriented people because it was as if everything was happening at once and they had sort of neurotic symptoms in relation to this. So, I mean, I think it's a condition that has existed before, but that FOMO's the contemporary guise of it. But that's my attempt. Next. <laughs> yeah, if it's just a personal question, I don't know. I can ask that. I know very good what is fear of missing out. It's very strong, but uh, there are other fears that are stronger. That's why, for example, I'm not on Facebook. So, yep. other fears that are stronger <laughs> than fear of missing out. I, I wouldn't be caught dead using this term, but I've been thinking about it, of course, because it's the title of the conference, and then again... <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I, I, I mentioned um, my colleague Bifo today already, and I, he gave a talk a couple of days ago, and he mentioned, um, I think it's, I, it, I, it is a fact, I went to the World Health Organization and I looked it up, and he said that since in the past 30 years, the suicide, global suicide rate had risen 60%, right? I mean, it's shocking, 60%, 30 years, 30 years of neoliberalism, right? And this contrasted very crudely with the term FOMO because it seems that 60% more people have no fear of missing out on anything whatsoever, right? So I thought this was again an example of these glaring inequalities, you no, know, in terms of desire or even for life itself that are being created by recent history, I mean, including all its technological ramifications. Um, well, FOMO is a term um, evolved around YOLO, the time of YOLO, and I think it's the exact opposite of YOLO, which is you only live once, and that's a kind of, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a term that's like, you know, stems from the joy of life, whereas FOMO stems from the fear of death and not experiencing anything. And I, I guess, personally, I would relate to this. I mean, it's, it's what drives my life and my career. And it's, um, I think, very easy for a young person starting their career to try to do everything. And for me, being a freelancer, I, I graduated from undergrad during the financial crisis in 2008. And I have never really had a job, ever. I've, I've, I got my first part-time job uh, last year. And uh, I, I guess that means that I just have to accept everything and do everything, but that also kind of cast me as this kind of prime neoliberal subject that's stressed out all the time, um, you know, flying everywhere to catch a $200 check, and um, also very, very afraid if I don't continually put my voice into a system that I will be forgotten. And I see that. I see people actually intentionally pulling out, like our colleague Guthrie Lonergan, whose work we showed tonight. He's, you know, pretty much intentionally not making internet art anymore. I'm not totally sure why. I don't know if he has FOMO, but um, I don't think that I would have the um, bravery to opt out personally. And this is why I'm kind of traveling a lot. <laughs> And I think, for, for me personally, um, I think FOMO is a really um, an experience, I, I guess, that, I don't know, people have had for hundreds of years, but it's probably one that um, uh, can be um, s served, or served quite well with technology, which I think um, makes or gives technology a very interesting edge. I mean, if you remember, for example, um, with television, I don't know, um, at least in continental Europe, it was like this. So you had, like, television programs would stop at midnight, and then you would have, like, the test image come on. And 
you, I mean, you couldn't do that anymore today. I mean, fear of missing out, you know? I mean, you can't, you can't stop broadcasting and people need to be connected always. They may be awake at night and they cannot, you know, this television will always also get, um, at least as a child, it gave me this, um, maybe this feeling of being connected with the world because there was this one program and there were, you know, potential of so many people watching and you could talk about it later. And this, I, I really like this about the test image that it sort of, it didn't have that fear of missing out. I, I quite, you know, the, the way technology also changes the, in, the intensity or the times you can fear of, you know, have this fear of missing out. Could I perhaps add uh, to that? I'm here, Stephen, um, because me and Rosalie selected the title for the conference. I think it's going to be oh, Stephen, an, wait, an opportunity. Uh, let, let, let Tomo, uh, Tomo respond. And, and then yeah, I, mean, I just okay. wanted to add that yeah. I always, I also have the feeling that I want to be opt-in. I want to be part of everything. You know, I'm. Uh, I fe feel that the internet is kind of breaking in a sense of being more and more nationalized and I don't have access to things anymore and uh, feel, feel kind of, you know, being out of the left out of the stream, which is kind of happening in the British. So I, uh, we, we experiment with tools which surround those feelings. So we started to use, we changed our user agent of our browser to be the Google bot. And this means that you have all access. I mean, like there's, there's no, country barriers anymore because everybody wants to be open for Google and for the Google bot. So you can we really try to play with that in our, I don't know, uh, daily experience uh, or media experience. Okay, Stephen, and then we have one more question. Uh, last, yeah, first, Stephen, let, let him react, of course, um, because it's also a question to the yeah, audience. Yeah, I mean, here. firstly, myself and Rosalie selected the title partly because we felt it was quite a humorous, a humorous title to, to use for the conference, but also because it's kind of twofold. Uh, on the one hand, you have a fear of missing out, which is, very, is a very, very social fear, and a, a fear we can all associate with and understand, but it's also a fear that's used to control, a fear of missing out or a fear of purchasing, especially in this sort of consumer culture that we talk about, that fear is something that's been harnessed in a very different way. So acknowledging that fear socially is quite a key thing. I think it's a thing that is going to run throughout the conference. It's not something that we're very, very specific about placing on everyone's presentations. It's just an awareness that we thought was quite curious and at the same time humorous. Okay, one so last one, question. So one question at the back. No, one, one question in the back, yes. Thanks. I've really enjoyed um, the discussion tonight, especially the bringing together of a sociological perspective, and I just wanted to come back to the question about audience. And um, I was think, uh, struck by the way in which when um, Olia was talking about early net art, uh, the idea of escaping the art world and having a direct kind of relationship with an audience and the kind of possibilities that had. And then we hear Guthrie Lonergan um, now uh, no longer making net art or internet-based art um, uh, and, and sort of escaping uh, that and are turning away from that. But also, uh, thinking uh, again about Olia's work and the thinking about the user and the aesthetic brilliance of users on the network. And then we have artists also beginning to use social media for whom um, the question is then, how is it recognized as art in these networks? Um, so why, how is it that, I'm very uh, interested in this question of the artists using social media and how is it somehow better or more useful, or more interesting than the, than the user who's making brilliant, interesting things on social media. So I guess it was more a question about reception and where this work goes. Is it on the one hand, if we think about um, uh, the botnet shopper, is it a conceptual gesture that goes off into the world and maybe you see it online or you don't? Um, what, what is the status of the audience then in relation to um, these changes in the web art and uh, media? 
if I should uh, answer it shortly, that uh, of course there is uh, also, there's not only net art and uh, uh, post-internet, there is, it's very interesting what happens now also in social networks, and there are artists who are, for whom the social network is a material itself, yeah? So Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Twitter, and uh, all these uh, ideas about the followers and self-representation in networks. So this is material, really. Yeah? These are not just channels. And this is completely different practice, a new one. And I think it's extremely difficult field, especially uh, because, uh, uh, because of what you are mentioning. It's very right observation, because uh, actually everybody is motivated to be an artist in this. Uh, on Instagram, everybody is an artist. Yeah? It's difficult to be an artist. <laughs> among other artists. It's a very noble job to be an, to be an uh, artist on Instagram. Mm, I think... Um, I would say we actually find it really interesting to... Um, when we work online in or in performance formats to not um, know who the audience is and to ha leave the work to be ambiguous also. I mean, we, of course, we're artists, so I guess we produce art, I don't know. But um, it, I think there are spaces where that question is not as as pressing or as also um, maybe confining um, and where th the work or the conceptual idea can sort of evolve differently and become or get other twists and where it's interesting um, that the I, I don't know I mean <laughs> I, I guess the, the difference is that when you uh, show something in the gallery, you have people who uh, go specifically to that space to look at art, whereas online, um, people just sort of stumble across the work, which um, we at least find is really interesting. And it's really interesting to, um, to get that feedback. I mean, we get a lot more feedback from online or performances online than we get from showing a gallery uh, work at a gallery somewhere where we're not present. You know, we have no feel for that, for what's happening with the work there. Mm -hmm. So I think it, I mean, it gives us um, channels which are really interesting for us. And also, like, the social networks also saved our ass during the delivery performance. So. I mean, our infrastructure server-wise collapsed. There was Twitter, it was still there, where we could still publish the, our feed and our story, what, what's happening with the parcel, and upload the pictures manually. But still, there was something we could use, um, so it could continue. And we realized how fluid that is. Also, that people are jumping; they are stay on your page, and if you perform on Twitter, they'll follow there. And I mean, like, yeah, and we, we use those tools a lot and it also defines our projects I think that we want to be kind of conceptual clear within 160 uh, characters yeah we want to have something maybe a story or something which is which is uh, yeah which can be tweeted yeah and it's also a condition I think that when we think about art on social platforms, we kind of have to take them case by case and not kind of subscribe one methodology or kind of judgment upon all of them because um, I, I see a lot of people performing on Twitter or um, Instagram, so on and so forth, and I think that that actually can describe a, a contemporary uh, affectation and subjectivity that's not possible much of anywhere else and it can reflect upon itself as social media and how that is a very very important method of um, communication but at the same time if we look at other platforms such as um, sedition which is a uk-based um, like 
Like you can buy digital editions of works that are basically GIFs, but they only work on that platform. And I was talking to a colleague about this platform and um, whether or not we could get a paycheck from it, basically, and whether or not that was ethical. And um, we came to the conclusion that basically, well, if we make this work, what happens to it after the site inevitably shuts off its server? And it's just not going to exist. And there's also not really a way to archive it to kind of um, really uphold the context that it was exist uh, created for. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Okay, there, there was maybe one very last question over there. Okay, then there is no question. Let me make just one very last brief comment also in order to um, try to make a transition to tomorrow's, or some of tomorrow's topics. What I found fascinating in the, in the Botshopper project was the double meaning of autonomy that was at work in there. Autonomy once in the sense of an automated system conjuring up all the fears of, you know, robots going wild, so to speak, or doing whatever they wanted. So autonomy in that sense versus using a sort of limited, well, maybe pretext of autonomy of art in order to be able to, well, p perform some of the actions that were part of that piece. So I think that the question of autonomy, especially for the art field, but also in a discussion of new technology and its consequences, especially in the military and so on, um, I think that will be very important for many of tomorrow's presentations also and for tonight. I'd really like to thank all of you for the wonderful and partly very moving also uh, debate. Thank you. Um.